Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Joanna Albala. I'm the Science Education Manager uh, at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and I'd like to welcome you to Science on Saturday. This is our second in the series of Marvelous Machines, and we have a really wonderful presentation for you today. So today we're going to hear about a marvelous machine that looks and analyzes atoms in biological samples. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our presenters to the stage, Dr. Mike Malfatti. And Dr. Malfatti is a toxicologist who received his PhD from UC Davis. And he's joined today by Kathy Wong, a biology teacher at Doherty Valley High School. Let's give them a warm welcome, please. All right, you ready? <laughs> All right, well, thank you, and good morning. Um, yeah, today, we're going to talk about accelerator mass spectrometry and how we're using it in the biomedical field to solve human health problems. So you may not know it, but we are exposed to chemicals on a daily basis, uh, whether it be in the air we breathe from pollutants that are put into the air by car exhaust or factory admissions, or in the soil that we grow our plants from um, pollutants running off and getting absorbed in the soil, or the water we drink um, with the um, pollutants getting into the water systems, and even the products we buy at the store, like cleaning products, a lot of chemicals, and even furniture can be treated with uh, chemicals for stain resistance or water repellent. So we're even getting exposed as we sit on our couch. Um, and also in the food that we eat, uh, whether it be pesticide residues on uh, fruits and vegetables, or even the process of cooking foods can produce toxic chemicals uh, that we can get exposed to through various routes of exposure, be it in ingestion, inhalation, or even contact with our skin. Most of the levels that we're exposed to, though, are very low, very low levels, and that makes them hard to detect. And we need to understand the health effects at these low levels of exposures. And to do this, we have to um, come up with ways that we can actually detect these, these low exposure levels. So that's one of our fundamental questions, is how do we detect low levels of exposures um, in humans? And the, a lot of the studies that we do in the laboratory, they use laboratory animals, and they use very high doses of chemicals um, so we can actually see and measure an effect. Well, these doses that we use really aren't realistic to what humans are actually getting exposed to. We're getting exposed to extremely low levels, where in the laboratory we're using higher levels, so it doesn't really add up to the effects that we see in animals in the laboratory to what humans are exposed to. And we also need to understand what these biological effects are at these low levels, because they can be very different than what we see at a high level of exposure. So how can we detect these low levels? One way is to use radioisotopes. Um, what radioisotopes are, they're radioactive atoms that we can attach to chemicals that we want to trace through biological systems. So we synthesize our chemical with the radioactive atom on it. And this here, I'm showing carbon-14, which is the radioactive form of carbon. And carbon is the atom of choice, especially for biological studies, because carbon is everywhere. Everyone's made up of carbon. It's the most abundant atom in our universe. Um, so we can use this to put it on our chemicals and then trace them through a cellular system or an animal model in the laboratory or even in humans. But the problem with this is radioactivity can be toxic as well as high levels of chemicals. So we need to come up with a way to detect these very low levels of chemicals that people are getting exposed to in a real world situation and also so we can use these radiological atoms at very low doses so we can trace these through biological systems. And how do we do that? Well, at the lab in Livermore, we use accelerator mass spectrometry. And that's what we're going to be focusing our talk on today. We're going to go over what is it, how does it work, and what is it good for? So what is it? What is AMS? What it is, it's a very large counter. It counts long-lived radioactive atoms. 
and it compares the atoms to stable atoms that aren't radioactive, like carbon-12, which is the most abundant atom. So it measures isotope ratios, and it does this with extremely high precision and high sensitivity. And because we have such good sensitivity, that allows us to measure these chemicals at very low doses, equivalent to what people are usually exposed to. So we're talking about atoms and isotopes. So what actually are isotopes? Isotopes are elements like carbon um, with the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. So it gives them a different mass. So we have carbon-12, which has six protons and six neutrons. And that's, as I mentioned before, the most, mass, the most abundant atom um, in the universe. It's about 98.9%. And then there's carbon-13, which is in less abundant, and it has six protons and seven neutrons. And these are the two stable forms of carbon that are in, in, our, in our world. Uh, they don't change in mass, and they're very stable. But then you have carbon-14, which is um, very rare. There's only about 0.01% amount of carbon-14 um, in the universe. And it has six protons and eight neutrons. And this is the unstable form of carbon, which makes it radioactive. If you have an instability, you're always putting, making changes in, in your energy and releasing energy, and that's what makes you radioactive. And it's that energy that's being released that allows us to detect it as a radioactive element. And that energy is always decaying at a certain rate, and that's called your radioactive half-life. And that's another way that we can detect these atoms is how they decay. By measuring their decay rate, we can determine how old things are, and we can also um, use that to measure these isotopes in these biological systems. So what the half-life is, is the time that it takes to reduce the radioactivity of that um, radioactive atom by one half. So carbon-14 is one of those long-lived rare isotopes that I mentioned. It's long-lived because its half-life is 5,730 years. So it stays around for a very long time. And that's advantageous to us because if you have a short half-life, you can't get a very precise measurement uh, when you're trying to measure these. Since it is um, relatively stable, we can get a, a good measurement on it. And it also allows us to um, use it for carbon dating, which we'll get into in a little bit. So if you look at the, the graph here, um, if you have a radioactive active atom and has activity at about 100, um, if it's a carbon atom, after 5,730 years, the activity will be reduced by one half, down to 50. And then if you go another 5,730 years, you're going to reduce it by one half again, so your total activity will be reduced down to 25. And we can take advantage of these rates of decay to um, measure how old things are, as well as measure um, the activity, and we can relate that back to the origins of where it came from. And now, um, Doherty Valley High School is going to come out and give a demonstration of half-life and how it's used. Thank you, Mike. Hi, everyone. We are from Doherty Valley High School, and we are here to model radioactive decay of C14. All right, let's take in our place. Remember, C14 is a unique atom. While C12 and C13 are stable isotopes, C14 is radioactive and therefore decays into a more stable state. So C14 has a half-life, as mentioned before, 5,730 years, okay? Um, now let's imagine that all the C14 atoms here uh, are part of a sample of a woolly mammoth from a really long time ago. Get ready, audience. We're about to observe the mammoth sample dramatically decay in half, all right? One, two, three. Woohoo! <laughs> Nice. What was initially a sample of uh, 15 C14 atoms, now we've decayed to about seven, which is half the original sample. Now let's imagine another 5,730 years, which is a pretty long time. Um, ready? One, two, three. Nice. Now we have a total of four C14 atoms, which is one-fourth the original number, Again, let's imagine another 5,730 years. One, two, three. All right, now we have two C14 atoms, which is about one-eighth of the original sample of the woolly mammoth. In total, we just observed 23,000 years of C14 decay. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Doherty. <laughs> All right, thank you. So it's this half-life that we can take advantage of, um, and along with the sensitivity of, of AMS. AMS actually um, originated in, in carbon dating, dating um, artifacts um, that have uh, died about 50,000 years ago. We can actually use the rate of decay from this carbon um, to estimate how old um, these, these artifacts are. And, and how this works is, uh, through cosmic radiation, it forms carbon-14 in the atmosphere by what's called neutron capture from nitrogen-14. So you have these carbon-14s in the atmosphere along with your stable carbon-13 and carbon-12. And all living things, they absorb this carbon into their body and uh, throughout their lifetime. And that ratio of your unstable C14 to your stable carbon-14 uh, carbon-12, sorry, rate, that ratio is fairly constant as you go through life. But when you die and you start to decay, that C14 also starts to decay because you're not absorbing it anymore, so it's a constant. But then the C14, because it's an unstable atom and it has that half-life, it starts to decay. And as it decays, that C14 to C12 ratio changes. And it's that change in ratio that you can back calculate to uh, determine how old an organism is. And that's how we get the, the carbon dating of this. And that's kind of how AMS was first developed. And then about, oh, 25, 30 years ago, these physicists and biologists at the lab got together and tried to um, thought of some ways that we can apply this AMS technology to biology and how we can trace these chemicals through biological systems at very low levels. Now remember, the power of AMS is its extreme sensitivity, as I keep saying. AMS can detect one carbon-14 atoms in one million billion atoms. That is a huge number. That's one in one quadrillion. Almost uncomprehensible, but we can do it. And just to kind of put things in perspective, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Lake Tahoe up in the Sierra Nevadas. It's a pretty big lake, right? 39 trillion gallons of water in a lake in a non-drought year. Well, if you took 50 milliliters of a chemical, which is about half of what you can fit in a turkey baster, and put that into the lake, and took a sample from the lake, AMS could detect that chemical. That's how sensitive it is. And not only that is it sensitive in detecting chemicals, the amount of radioactivity that AMS can detect is extremely small as well. You know, we're at the atom level. It requires very low levels of radiation to do these, these biological tests. For example, if you were to go to the doctor and get a chest x-ray, you'd be exposed to about 50 microsieverts of radiation. Now, a sievert is just a way to measure whole body radiation exposure. If you were to get on an airplane and fly down to LA, just because of the cosmic radiation, you would be exposed to five microsieverts of radiation. So this is all background that everyone gets um, you know, during their, their lifetime. Well, a typical AMS study to look at a, a nutrient study to follow nutrients through your body, you're only exposed to one microsievert. So that's one-fifth of a plane ride or one-fiftieth of a chest x-ray. And then a typical AMS drug or toxin study, which is what we do a lot of it at the lab here, you're exposed to about one nanosievert, which is 1,000 times less than one microsievert. So the amount of radioactivity that is required to do these type of studies is very low. So your exposure, there's no toxicity involved, but it still allows us to, to trace these chemicals to see where they're going in your body and, and what effects might occur. So now that we kind of know what AMS is in a general sense, how does it work? As I mentioned, it is a counter. It counts atoms. It counts long-lived radioisotope atoms. And how this works here is I'll kind of take you through it. You, you load your sample at the first step, and your sample has to be converted to graphite, which is a form of carbon, in order for it to get red. So you have all these different um, carbon ions that you load into the sample. You might have carbon-12, you might have carbon-13, and carbon-14 all together. You might also have a carbon-12 bound to a, a 
two hydrogens, which also, also equals 14, or a carbon 13 bound to one hydrogen. That equals carbon 14 too. Well, we're interested in just the carbon 14 atoms. So you load your sample, and then you go up, produce your carbon ions, and then through what's called a mass analysis magnet, you select the mass of, your, of interest. In our case, it's carbon 14. And the carbon 12s at this point, they get kicked out of here because their mass is, is too light. It's only 12. So we can get rid of the carbon 12s at our very first step. But we're still left with carbon 13 and carbon 14 and these other um, C carbon and hydrogen combinations that we need to get rid of. So what we do, we remove what's called these interfering ions that we're not interested in by accelerating them to about one-tenth the speed of light. And what this does is strips off all those hi unwanted hydrogens that we don't want. And at the end, we're left with just C14 and C13. So then it goes through another fragment analysis magnet, and that magnet uh, kicks out the C13s, which we're not interested in um, as much as the C14. So that last magnet gets rid of the C13s. So all we're left at the very end is our C14. And it's actually counting each individual C14 atom. And that's what gives us such precision. Instead of taking, most, most techniques will take an average of what your sample is. This gets exactly every atom counted. So that's why we can get this very nice precision in our measurements. So now Doherty Valley High is going to come out again and give you all a demonstration, actually, of how this actually works. Thank you, thank you. All right, Doherty Valley Biotechnology is back. And we are here to model how an AMS, or an accelerator mass spectrometer, works. So remember, AMS has the ability to separate atoms into different cups. And I want you to imagine an AMS as a track for atoms, in this case, carbon atoms. All right. Um, some atoms are able to move through the AMS with no problems, while others struggle and can't make the turns on the racetrack. So let's set up this marvelous machine. First, I'd like to introduce the C12 magnet. Her job is to make sure that the C12 carbon atoms are placed inside the collection cup. Right next to the C12 magnet, we have the accelerator. All right, accelerator. The accelerator acts as a super awesome car wash, strips down the ions, and the ions move, C13, C14 move, as if it was in uh, one-tenth the speed of light. And then next to the accelerator, we have our C13 magnet. C13 magnet's job is to collect all the C13 atoms. And then finally, we have our detector. And the detectors will detect C14. OK. Carbon atoms, start your engines. All right, ready, set, go. And they're off. Oh, super exciting. Look at all the C12 magnets. They're going to the C12 magnet. And there's so many C12 atoms. Which, with C12 out of the way now, the C13 and C14 are making the turn with no problem. They're going through the accelerator and look at that amazing slow-mo action so you can see the atoms move one-tenth of the speed. They're moving around, but now the C13 are moving toward the C13 magnet, and now C14 is ready to go, going around and able to go through the detector without any problems. Um, all right, C14 is going through the detector. Look at that slow-mo action, very nice. Woohoo! C14 won. So let's interview the winners real quick. Oh, we have the microphone here. Go C14. All right, C14, why are you so unique? Uh, I'd say it's because I'm radioactive. You're radioactive, look at that. And why are you excited that C14 won? Because I'm detectable. Detectable, and scientists are very excited that C14 is detectable. All right, congrats, C14, and thank you, Doherty Valley. Thank you, thank you. All right, thank you, Doherty Valley. Okay, well, we've been kind of telling you all these great things about uh, AMS. Um, but there is one thing that's not so great, is the getting your sample prepared to actually take the measurement. It's a very complex and multi-step and multi-day process. Because as I mentioned before, your sample has to be turned into graphite. And if you have a biological sample, like a tissue sample or a blood sample, um, it takes a lot of steps to get 
that into uh, graphite, which is then compatible for measurement. So the first thing you have to do, you, you take your sample, whether it be tissue or, or blood or whatever you have, and you have to dry it. You have to get rid of all the, the, the liquid that's, uh, that's in that sample. And that can take a long time, especially if, if you have a, a large sample. So that's a multi, it could be a multi-day process just to dry the sample. And then you have to combust and seal it. You could heat it up at about 900 degrees Celsius, and you actually form a CO2 gas at this point from your sample. So you're left with just this, um, this gas, which then has to be transferred and transferred to a sp special um, reaction tube. And we do that um, by using liquid nitrogen, and then that gets, um, it's called cryotransfer, and then that transfers it to the special reaction tube, where then we actually go and form the graphitization process through um, chemical catalysts. And a catalyst is just a chemical that drives your reaction to where you want it to go. So we want it to go to graphite. So again, it's another heating step at about 700 degrees Celsius. And with these chemical catalysts, then the CO2 gets um, converted to graphite, which is a pure form of carbon. And then after the graphitization process, then we have to load it into our sample target, and the sample target that you see there is a little cylinder about an inch and a half tall, and then we put some small granules of graphite into that, and then load it into our sample wheel, which is about the size of a steering wheel of a car, and then we put all these samples um, into that wheel, and then finally we put it on the AMS machine for measurement. So this takes a long time, and it's laborious, and it, um, it's, it's costly as well. So we're trying to come up with ways to reduce the time it takes to, for our analysis to increase our throughput, as well as reduce the cost of how much it costs to, to do these analysis. So we've come up with this way. We call it our online um, system where we can actually get results in real time. We don't have to take our samples and we don't have to form graphite. We just have a liquid sample and we deposit it on what's called a moving wire and then that moving wire goes into the machine to get read. And here's a little movie that kind of demonstrates that. So this is one of the setups we have out at the lab of, of one of the AMS machines. And we take the sample and we put it in these little vials and then the different chemical components get separated by what's, by what's called an HPLC. So through, and through chromatography, each chemical gets separated out. And then as those chemicals get set it out, we have this moving wire interface where the wire goes along on these this pulley system, and it goes through and it gets little dents put on the wire, and what that does is it allows the liquid to stick to the wire better. Otherwise, it kind of coalesces or, or falls off. So then as the wire goes through, it goes through what's called a cleaner, which is just like a, an oven. It heats the wire up and it, it gets rid of any contaminants um, or it, things that are on the wire that might interfere with our, our analyses. And after it goes through the, the cleaner, then the liquid sample that comes off the HPLC gets deposited as little droplets on this wire as it moves past. And that passes through another drying oven to get rid of any of the liquid that's on the, on the, the wire. So all you're left is with is just your chemical of interest stuck on the wire. And that goes through a combustion oven, which combusts it into CO2. And then the CO2 gets transferred through a very small tube, it's called the capillary tube, um, and gets sent to the AMS. And the AMS then measures the CO2 gas, um, which has your carbon-14 atoms in it from your sample. And as it gets measured, we get a graphical representation of how much C14 is there compared to how much C12 as well. And as you can see on the bottom there, which will get big right now, you can see we get a graphical representation, representation of the ratio between C14 and C12. And this is advantageous because, one, we can do it in real time. It only takes minutes to get this uh, analysis, where before, when you have to do a solid graphite sample, it could take days. It also lowers the amount of chemicals that we need for our analysis, and, we don't, um, and it also improves our sensitivity by about 100-fold by doing it this way, because you're not losing anything in the, in the graphite um, formation stage. So this has really helped increase our throughput, um, also increase our sensitivity so we don't have to have large samples, um, and it's also reduced the cost uh, it takes to, to get our analysis done. And we actually have three instruments at the lab that we use um, for analysis. There's the, a very large instrument, which is the one there on 
the left hand side. Um, it takes up about a warehouse size room for, uh, for it because it's very large. I've highlighted the steps there in that box to kind of give you an idea of scale. So it, it's very large. It's the most powerful AMS that we have and it's used to analyze a lot of different radioisotopes for a lot of different applications. And then the medium sized one up in the upper right um, that one is used uh, mainly for analysis of natural carbon, to, to analyze samples that um, just have natural C14 in them through uh, um, the atmosphere. And that's look, done for carbon cycling as well as um, dating and geochemical purposes. And then the small machine on the bottom, that's the one that we use for all our biomedical applications. Um, it's strictly dedicated for biology and it only detects C14. So it doesn't have to be as powerful as these other machines, but it fits in a more small, uh, smaller lab, which is nice. And that's the one that's hooked up to this moving wire interface that I uh, just showed you earlier. So now that I've kind of told you what AMS is and, and how it works, how do we use it for, for biology? What do we do? Well, we can actually go in and safely assess toxins or drugs in humans using AMS because we can use these very low levels of chemicals and radioactivity, um, we can actually expose humans to these chemicals at non-toxic, extremely low doses that are relevant to what someone might get exposed to in the real world and assess the, the risks that might be involved. So we call that low dose toxicity. And how, what do we do with that? Is we can assess um, exposure, how people are exposed, um, and determine what's called body distribution or, or fate studies. So once someone is exposed to a, ch uh, a chemical at these low doses, we can trace it through the body um, and determine where it goes, um, how long it stays there, um, what organs might be affected as well. And we can also do metabolism studies because many times when you're exposed to a drug or a chemical, you metabolize it, which means you convert it to different chemicals as you, the process through your, your body occurs. So we can determine w how these chemicals are, are processed or metabolized. And we can also do molecular studies to see how chemicals and drugs interact with DNA or cells or proteins um, and determine if chemicals can go in and damage your DNA. And by damaging your DNA, you can cause mutations, which sometimes can cause cancer. And all this, this data that we can collect allows us to get a better risk assessment of these exp at, at these real world exposure levels in actual humans. So we don't have to rely on, on high dose animal studies to get risk assessments that we want to apply to humans. We can go directly to humans. As I mentioned, you know, we can look at uh, DNA damage using AMS because DNA, everyone um, should know, is you know, in all of our cells, it's the building blocks of life. Um, it's very small and it's hard to detect as well. So we can use AMS to detect how chemicals actually interact with DNA. The way we do this, again, we, we synthesize the chemical of interest that we want to look at. We put a carbon-14 atom on it, and then we expose it to uh, cells or humans or whatever, and then it goes in and binds DNA. Well, when it binds DNA, it actually can damage the DNA. And as the DNA replicates, as your cells divide, then you can get DNA mutations. And these DNA mutations can ultimately go and form tumors. So we want to be able to understand how this mechanism works at these really low levels of exposure. And this level of DNA binding of these chemicals is indicative of how much DNA damage you can get. So AMS could actually quantify the amount of DNA binding so we can get a better idea of how much damage exposure to these chemicals are, are doing at these extremely low levels. So that brings us back to our fundamental question, are low exposures to chemicals hazardous? Well, we did a lot of work um, at the lab and we determined that um, there's these carcinogens that are formed when you cook meat at high temperatures, like barbecuing them or grilling. These chemicals are called heterocyclic amines and they form on the surface of hamburger and chicken and stuff while you cook them. Now we did some studies in the lab with these chemicals using animals um, to see how hazardous they were. Well, when you expose high doses of these chemicals to animals, yes, they form tumors and they get cancer. But our question is, well, what happens when you get exposed to very low doses that someone might get by eating a barbecued hamburger? Is that going to cause cancer in a human? So we 
looked at this using AMS by taking these chemicals, again, we synthesized it, put a C14 label on it, and then we put it in a pill form, and the levels that we, we used here of the chemical were levels that would someone who would typically be exposed to if they were eating well-done grilled meat. And we had human volunteers um, ingest this chemical, and the dose was about the equivalent of equally, equally eating two hamburgers, and then the radioactive dose was about one-fifth of a chest x-ray, so very low levels um, that really don't have any effect on the body, but it allows us to trace it using AMS. So after they took this chemical dose, then we got a very small blood sample from them, and we took that blood sample and we put it on the AMS. And we were able to follow it and count the amount of C14, which is associated with the chemical, and determine the biological fate of this chemical to see how it was metabolized, what tissues it interacted with, how it was eliminated as well. And we also looked how it interacted with DNA, because from the blood sample we can isolate DNA from white blood cells and then look and see if this chemical actually binds human DNA. So we had 10 individuals that we did this test on, and we quantified the DNA binding level by AMS, and then we also compared it to our animal studies because we also did this in a rat because we wanted to see if the rat model could actually predict what was happening in humans. Well, what we found was quite interesting in that you can see there's a lot of variation in the DNA binding level in these 10 humans, which is expected because everyone's different. Their genetic makeup is, is not the same. So you're going to have different responses in different individuals. But the interesting thing is every human that we looked at actually had higher DNA binding levels than the animal model that we were relying on to give us an indication of how um, toxic this chemical might be. So the DNA damage in humans was actually about five-fold higher in the human um, patients than in the rats. So what that kind of told us is humans are not rodents. You know, we kind of all know that. But we can't rely on, on these uh, laboratory animals to, to tell us what's happening in humans. It's best you know, to do these low-dose exposures in actual humans because that gets us to the data that we really, really, really want. And this is the same example of the same study where we looked at the metabolism of this compound as it goes through the body and it gets changed and it forms two major metabolites after you get exposed to this. And we looked at the metabolite profiles, again, in the rat and the human. And you can see in the rat, metabolite 1 was pretty much the predominant metabolite. But in the humans, that was very minor. And metabolite 2 was actually the major metabolite. And if you go and do some chemistry and stuff and identify these, these metabolites, it turns out that metabolite 2 was indicative of a more toxic response than metabolite 1. So again, just like we saw in the DNA binding data, the metabolism is also indicating that this compound is a little bit more toxic in humans than it is in rodents. So again, we need to rely on human models instead of rodent models to do these risk assessment determinations. And just to summarize that, animal models are not humans. The best model to use for a human study is a human. And AMS allows us to do that because we can do these risk assessments at these real world exposure levels that people are actually getting exposed to and not real high levels that you might see in, in, a, in a laboratory experiment. So the next thing I want to talk to you about is how AMS is used uh, in drug development. Now drug development is a very time consuming and costly process. It's estimated it takes about 15 years and $1 billion to get one drug to market. That's a lot of money and that's a lot of time. And that's why our drugs are so expensive. Because the pharmaceutical companies need to recoup all this money that they put into getting these drugs developed. And it's also a multi-stage process. You have drug discovery where you're screening tens of thousands of different compounds to see if they're going to work. And then once you do that, you go into stage two, which is preclinical development, where you're doing animal studies and cellular studies on hundreds of compounds to try and find out which one will work and which ones won't. You can weed out the ones that don't work. And then you go on to stage three, which is clinical development, is where you're actually testing your drug candidate in humans. And it's in this stage three where most of the, your drugs fail. So you've done all this work and all 
put all this time into stage one and two, but you don't know until stage three if you're actually going to get a drug that works. And then after that, you go through all the FDA regulatory process, and then if you're lucky, you get your one drug. So how can AMS help? Well, AMS could actually help shorten the development time of a drug through this um, process called microdosing, where we can give humans earlier in this drug development process a very small dose of the drug with a carbon-14 label tag on it so we can trace it. So we can determine early in the drug development process if a drug is going to work or if it's going to be um, bad, and we can take it out of the, the, the product line. So microdosing can help by looking at human studies earlier, which helps us eliminate what's called the bad leads earlier in the drug development process. So how does this work? Microdosing, what we do is we administer a very, very low level of the, of the drug that has a little bit of radioactivity into it to humans. The level is so low that the drug's not going to help anybody if they're sick, but it's not going to be toxic either because the levels are that low. But it is going to give us an indication of how the drug is processed through the body, which will give us uh, an idea of how well the drug can um, be efficacious or be, do what it's supposed to do. And it allows us to determine if we can take that drug and move it on for further testing. So what this does, if we can do this early in the process, we can reduce the time and the cost of the drug development and these late stage failures. We can find our failures early in the process, which will reduce the time. And this is just an example of um, comparing a microdose of a drug with a therapeutic dose of the drug, which is the, the dose that you would use if you were taking the drug if you were sick. So the, uh, the blue line on top shows the therapeutic drug. This is the concentration of the drug in blood. And the bottom line, the yellow line, shows the microdose of the drug. And you can see the lines look pretty similar. And that's what you want, because you want your microdose to predict what's going to happen at the therapeutic dose. So in this case, it looks like they predict each other pretty well. So this would probably be a drug that you would want to go and bring forward and further develop to get it to market. And we can do this, again, early to reduce the time it takes to do that. So the next thing uh, we can use AMS for is personalized medicine. So what is personalized medicine? Well, you know, everybody has a different genetic makeup and everybody's uh, going to respond to drugs differently. And you know, right now, these drug companies, they make one drug and they say it's good for everybody. Well, it's not good for everybody because everyone's going to respond differently based on their genetic makeup or their physical appearance or their size and their weight. Um, some people might have a great response. They get sick, you take the drug, everything's good. Another person might be hypersensitive to the drug where they need to reduce their dose because a higher dose can actually hurt them. So you need to reduce it. Another person could be just the opposite, where you have to increase the dose so they can get the advantageous effect from the drug. Or you might have someone who has no response to that drug, and you need to give them a different drug to, uh, to get a good effect. So we want to, wanted to come up with ways, and you know, the question was, how do you identify these people, and how do you um, tailor the drug to each person so they get the best beneficial effect? Well, it turns out you can use AMS. We can have developed a, a, a test in cancer therapy. It's called a diagnostic test where we can actually predict how people are going to respond to chemotherapy before they get the treatment to treat their cancer. Because it, especially with chemotherapy, not all patients respond. It's, most of the drugs that are out there um, only about 30% of the people that get the drug are going to have a favorable response to the drug to help them cure the cancer. So you have about 70% of the people that aren't going to get any beneficial effect, but they're going to get all the bad side effects because chemotherapy gives you very bad side effects. It's very toxic because it's trying to kill cancer cells, and it also kills normal cells as well. So we want to have a test where we can identify who's going to respond and who's not going to respond to the drug. Because if you're not going to respond, we don't want you to be susceptible to all these toxic side effects. Because a lot of people will die just from the treatment and not the cancer because it's so toxic. So with AMS and this whole microdosing approach, we can actually identify people um, based on how they 
react to a microdose of this drug on if they're going to respond or not respond to the drug. Because most chemotherapeutic drugs, they actually go in and they bind and damage DNA in the cancer cells, and that's what kills the cell. So we have devised this test to look at DNA damage, and the, the higher the DNA damage um, in these cells, the better response you're going to have by killing the cancer cells, and you would be considered a responder, which is what's the blue line up there. If you have a low level of DNA damage, you might not be as responder to this drug, and then you're always going to get people that are kind of in the middle, which is a yellow line, where you have to make a treatment decision. So how this works is, is we give a cancer patient who's been recently diagnosed with cancer this microdose of a carbon-14 labeled drug. It's not going to help them, but it's not going to hurt them either. But we can still trace it through their body. So after we give them this microdose, then we take a small blood sample. We isolate the DNA from the white blood cells in, in the blood sample, and then we run it on the, D, on the AMS. And then we quantify how much of this drug is actually bound to your DNA. If you have a lot of the drug bound to your DNA, that means it's interacting with the DNA and it has the potential of killing cancer cells. So you're going to be sensitive or you're going to be um, someone who wants to get the treatment. If you don't have very much DNA, uh, I'm sorry, chemical bound to your DNA, um, that means you're probably going to be resistant to the treatment and it's not going to help you because it's not going to kill the cancer cells. So we could make an informed decision now based on this test on who is going to benefit um, from the drug treatment and have an advantageous um, outcome from their cancer treatment. And if you're a resistant person, you don't want to get this drug, and you know, then you have the, the information that you need to maybe go to a, a different drug or a different type of treatment um, for your cancer. And then again, as I mentioned, if you're sensitive, then you want to go forward with this treatment and hopefully get a positive outcome. So, in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that AMS is a pretty important tool to use in biomedicine. Um, we can use it for these low-dose toxicity studies um, to get precise risk assessments at real-world exposure levels in humans, so we don't have to rely on, on animal models and, and high-dose experiments. Um, we can use it in drug development to, to reduce the time and the cost it takes to get drugs to market, which is good. You know, you want drugs to be out on the market um, that can help you. And if you can reduce the time and the cost, then drug prices hopefully will go down. Um, and then we can use it in personalized medicine, uh, where we can actually tailor the treatment of a drug to an individual based on their response. So I'd like to thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions.